I'm Robert Bean, and this is Focus, Purpose and Leadership. I decided to create this podcast because in my 40-year career in the advertising and brand strategy worlds, I've come to learn about the fundamental importance of clarity and purpose, or in my terms, the value of having a single organizing principle, one that influences a business's culture, its products and services, and its reputation. In this series, I'll be chatting with CEOs and leaders who have put it into practice whilst developing their own successful businesses. In this episode, I talked to Claire Blampier OBE, the managing director of the family-owned pasta sauces business Sackler UK. She started it aged 26 and has grown it into a £40 million business whilst proudly proclaiming herself as the original pesto pioneer. We met at their HQ in Beaconsfield, just outside London. I have been saying to people, and you've heard me say very often about if you want to understand anything in life, look to the origin. And we started working in the together in the mid-90s, I think, but I'd missed out on the formative part of the business, and I wonder if I could take you back there and you could just tell us about how it started. There you are, age 26. Having been doing what? I did food science at university. Then I did a year's air hostessing, which was my university of life. Then I joined a frozen food manufacturer making burger buns mm-hmm. and Uh, My task was to take them from wholesale into retail, Um, along with other things. I'd actually joined them to do NPD and uh, then started doing a bit of selling for them. And the bright lights of London beckoned and I joined a food importer in London. And one of the brands that that food importer had looked after in the UK in the food service channel for about 30 years was Sankler. So food service channel being... Hotels, restaurants, catering, wholesale. Branded product or? uh, Yes, branded. Mm. But just taking products that the factory made are not necessarily the products that people wanted to buy. But, um, you know, uh, vegetables in brine in big tins. And the grandson of the founder of Sackler had just finished his American university education and joined his family business. And he was asked to go and conquer the world. And his knowledge of the UK market sent, brought him here. And uh, we started working on a plan to launch Sackler in retail here in the UK. So Which they asked you to set up an office, <clears throat> said they would supply all the products. Not, not at that particular stage. Thereafter, so January 89, we sat down and we hatched a plan to launch Pesto. We had Basil Pesto. Um, so we only had one product. So we did some product development. We created a tomato pesto, which um, the uh, president of the company called Bastardo. He called it a bastard pesto. It was not really anything that would would have been mm. known in Italy. No, but, but they're like that. Oh aren't well, they? to some extent. But also, yeah. of course, what we were trying to do is we we're saying look, we've got to plug into existing consumer behaviour, which is you know we the the pasta and the sauce that we were eating back in 1989 was red. It was tomato based. So let's add some tomatoes. And the other sauce that we were eating at the time was creamy. So we launched. We added some cream to basil pesto. The president declared that cream. Criminal, criminal pesto, he called it. (laughs) And we set about launching. So in summer of 89, um, we took journalists out to the basil fields, picked basil, followed the basil trucks up to the factory um, and turned the basil that they had picked into pesto. That had probably never been done before, had it? No, we spent a lot of time and a lot of money Money, actually schmoozing. It was in the days when, you know, a a food writer would get a whole page of the Daily Telegraph and, uh, um, and, you know, you could get great cut through with food. People were really interested in it. So uh, we, they all came home and wrote about it, which actually forced listings into the retailers. So I never had to sell pesto. I was just marketing it. We created a demand through the journalists. And it was a moment in time. It was 1989, coming up 1990. World Cup was in Italy. The Brits were in love with everything Italian, whether that was football, opera, fashion, cars, you name it. Pavarotti was blasting out Nessun Dorma. 
And it took off. And Sainsbury's, who at the time were very focused on their own label uh, portfolio, asked if we'd pack it own label. They did us, or they did the pesto market the hugest favour by putting um, pesto onto television, their own Sainsbury's pesto onto television uh, with Zoe Wanamaker, who cooked it with tagliatelle and mushrooms and bacon. And we went from nothing to you know quite significant sales and it was at that stage that the Italian family with great foresight said look we want to open our first subsidiary we want to do it here and will you lead it for us. So had the UK consumer known about pesto before that moment then? No. So when it how was it positioned then? Here's this thing called pesto it comes from Italy and it's great what how was it positioned? I guess we we launched pesto as a pasta sauce. Um, my memory lets me down sometimes now, but I think I'm right in saying I don't think Dolmio had actually launched back in 1989, 90. Mm. And we were used to putting, you know, very wet sauces, um, you know, tomato-based or creamy on top of pasta, and it's sinking to the bottom of the dish. This idea of having a concentrated sauce that you just stirred through. And... Uh, you know, I can remember one one day very early on, you know, what are the ingredients of pesto? Or maybe it wasn't even that. Maybe what is what is basil, pine nuts and parmesan cheese? The question, what those ingredients made, was on mastermind. Was it? You know, it was, yeah, yeah amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. <laughs> but was it you pushing pesto to, to the Italians saying, look, there's a gap here. They might like it because there isn't anything quite like it. Or... Had the Italians spotted the gap? I I can't remember which way round it happened, to be honest. I mean, if you think about it, it's the ultimate challenger. So again, go back to 1990, you've got the World Cup and, and this love affair with all things Italian. But the supermarkets had no pasta aisle, no pasta sauce aisle. Mm. They were selling that lovely, beautiful sort of three foot long spaghetti in blue packets. And we were putting mints and dried parmesan on the top and calling it spaghetti bolognese, mm. which actually we invented because that doesn't exist in Italy either. So, um, you know, there was an, an enormous education job to do, but people were very open. You know, that massive investment made in television advertising um, where they showed the product on, on pasta was, was golden for us. Mm. And it came from a real Italian family. Absolutely, yeah. Which was as meaningful then as it is. Now. That hasn't changed, has it? I, I don't think it has. Um, I think it's it's a little bit more reassuring now for the consumer rather than completely motivating. They like the reassurance. I don't think they'd um, switch out of a favourite product because it wasn't made in Italy. No. Um, but, you know, the, the conoscenti, the, the, the discerning food lovers want the product that's got the provenance and the and the family story we're not a big multinational we're a family owned family run business mm. you know as well as i do it's the family very very involved very i mean yeah mm. daily mm. and what about the relationship then between you and the italians so you and you you mentioned it earlier they are quite conservative aren't they about their food generally i don't mean just the family but generally they're Lots of arguments, but no, you don't make it like that. And God forbid you should ever put you know, cheese yeah, with yeah. feet. I mean, it's, it's criminal. But, but here you've got a Ligurian recipe from people in Asti bypassing Rome, by the sounds <laughs> yeah. of it. And presumably with your NPD background then, you're pushing ideas at them from ill-educated Brits, as it were, and they are how about that do they do they wince every time you suggest something or did they play along i think criminal pesto was was really pushing <laughs> yeah, the boundaries with them the, the creamy pesto and we don't actually sell that any longer but i mean i i think we had it was it was freedom within a framework and we were really really sure that we needed to have Italian roots somewhere, whether that was how we were growing the vegetables, how we were combining the recipes, the combinations of the ingredients that we were putting together. We had to have Italianness really, really, you know, deep rooted in those products. So they were very, very open, you know, provided I mean I do remember actually coriander pesto. I thought there would be a really good opportunity for a coriander pesto. And there was. And actually, we do still sell that in quite significant volume. So I asked them to make a coriander pesto. 
So at first they didn't know what coriander was and then there were a few objections because it was deemed an Asian ingredient, mm. not a particularly not a bit, Italian yeah. one. So I found some fantastic references to coriander being used in Roman times um, and uh, how it had been grown down in the south of Italy and so on. So eventually they agreed that they would make some coriander pesto samples for us. And this product took an age. It just The kitchen sample just never arrived here. Anyway, when eventually it did, it was a rather nasty brown colour. And I looked at it and blow me, they'd use the seeds, not the leaves. <laughs> so we had to go back to the starting point and start growing the coriander again to get green leaves rather than um, the, uh, uh, the brown seeds. Yeah. You know, So that was a long process. So they did, they slightly balked at that one, but we now have chili pesto, truffle pesto. I mean, at the end of the day, as a brand leader, which we are, we have a significant market share. You've got a responsibility to do new things and to have a go. So... Uh, we'll come back to the products in a minute, but uh, y- you mentioned being the market leader there, which you are on the one hand, and on the other hand, it started as a challenger, and I know that you've always wanted it to have the spirit of being a challenger. So how do you reconcile those two seemingly diametrically opposed things, being the market leader on the one hand and yet being the challenger that's not easy i think you can cut numbers any which way you want to really to help back up your story can't Mm. you so we are the brand leader in pesto we were the original pioneers we we created the market and we've grown the market um and as i said we remain um in the number one position by quite some margin uh, people love us. We had that first mover advantage and people were brought up on the taste of Sackler and we do have quite a good taste difference. Within the total pasta sauce market, pesto still has a very small share. And our job, um, believing that our job here is to, to transform food lives, to wow food lives, our job is to make sure that more people eat authentic Italian pesto sauce than drown their pasta with made in UK red pasta sauce. And actually, if you're a pasta fan, you're eating pasta three, four times a week. So um, you want some variety and you want some difference. So we're a little bit more special occasion. Kids love us. We're very easy for small children um, and we're very quick and easy for mums. There's no need to add meat. It's a complete meal in a jar with you know, just the addition of some freshly cooked pasta. So that freedom in a framework that mm-hmm. you referred to earlier, w- what was the framework then? I mean, you talked about it being rooted in Italian. Was that the framework? And how much has that framework changed from then to now? Our framework is definitely Italian. We have, you know, loud and proud on the on the label, Sackler Italia. Everything that we sell here in the UK is made in Italy. Mm. Um, and quite rightly, that's that's the way it is. It's about the authenticity. We talk a lot about know how and that our know how in how to process vegetables, how to combine them and put them into delicious tasting products that then um, give the wow factor. So actually it's it's about wow how rather mm. than just know how. <laughs> So the, the, the governing force then that's allowed you to keep pioneering and find yourself at the top of the pile and now pushing the market really, you know, keep pioneering and being the market leader and yet maintaining this position of being small, not corporate, family owned and run, quite a juggle, isn't it? I, I don't tend to think of it like that because I just do it you know I've and it's what I've been doing for such a long time and it's what the family's been doing for such a long time and you know there are some great teams of people both here in the UK and in Italy lots of long servers people who really understand and know the business and are are, are very careful with it you know very considerate with it so um yeah I think I think sometimes you know we we are it's still a little bit of a David and Goliath we don't have the hugest budgets 
it's that talkability that we strive to to get and to achieve, which is getting people to, you know, love and and talk about us. Um, I, I remember a, a great guy. You, you'll remember working with him too. Um, we talked about brand fame and wanting the business to be talked about and the brand to be talked about. And he had this expression. He said something needs to be laugh out loud, funny, WTF attention grabbing, or OMG surprising. And I think <laughs> you know through all our comms and our activities with a business that was built on PR you you strive to be sort of noticed notable and uh, yeah talked about Mm. I I like that the 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 basically what you're saying is just head down and kept doing it and behaving in the natural way which was to care for the products and be a challenger and be as Mm. it were family owned and run and before you know it there you are at the top of the tree but not thinking that way just thinking more challenge away yeah but enough yeah. challenging ends up putting you in the front spot which Absolutely. is quite an interesting sort of reverse and, and again, philosophy yeah credit to the factory you know they were always keen to make what consumers wanted to buy and not what they could make so there's been huge investment in the mm-hmm. factory over the years and um and and in getting the best product and and you know doing the best you could do there's a real spirit of continuous improvement within this business and the business back in Italy, you know, we don't rest on our laurels. There's always more we can be doing. And that goes back to, you know, we've got a responsibility as the brand leader to be doing the best for the brand. Well, you know, it's a bit of a legacy brand, you know, three generations now. So Chiara, our, um, our chairman here in the UK, whose grandparents started the business, you know, pushes us. Mm. She wants the best for mm. what her grandparents started. Mm. So up to the modern day then, ha- the, the, what is the breadth of the range now in terms of number of products? It, you know, it started with three and it's now 303. Not, not quite, I no. wish. No. I think um, basil pesto and tomato pesto are still um, by far and away our our best sellers Uh, that's what consumers remember and what they've become extremely loyal to over the years but you know there are new trends that we've had to make sure we we keep across one size does not fit all so we've launched pots uh, which are single serve and that's really great because it's getting us into new channels like those recipe boxes and, and food service um, we've got dietary concerns, so increase in veganism and vegetarianism. So we've replaced Parmesan cheese with tofu in one of the recipes. People worried about fat content. And of course, when olive oil and Parmesan cheese are two of your key ingredients. We've now just launched a recipe to reduce the fat, again, by taking the Parmesan out and reducing the oil. Then we've got flavours. So we've got flavours for what I call midweek meals, chili aubergine and then we've got flavors for weekends like truffle and undouya so pesto for everyone i think there are about 15 pestos in total now i can see how the 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 pestos themselves keep you at a premium a bit more special than Mm. the regular up and down pasta sauce positioned alongside the mainstream so how have you managed that premium in what is essentially a mainstream market, leave aside pesto for a minute. I don't quite know how we've done it, really, Robert. I mean, it just, it always has been. When we launched back in 1990, I think we launched at 109, um, when, you know, you could buy a jar of, um, you know, pasta sauce at 49p. So we've always had a premium. Um, I think the the fact it's a, an authentic product and we only use the best basil and the best oil and the best parmesan. Um, you know, we've we've been lucky that consumers and customers have have recognised that. Um, maybe we've created something that's a little bit aspirational. Uh, you know, the real taste of mm, Italy, yeah. um, and 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 people have understood that. Um, Mm. I think it's just, you know, consistency. You know, there's no doubt about it. We've created a brand that people are very loyal to. Um, I, I don't really know how we've done it. We haven't, We haven't. of course, we promote, but we haven't got fixed on the drug of promotions in the same way as some other pasta sauce brands have. And there, but for the grace of God. Uh, and, <laughs> and, I mean, the, the risk of sounding more complacent than I mean to, and I really don't mean to, but nobody has really come along and challenged that your pesto dominance, have they? I mean, own label constantly nibbling away at it, but in brand terms, 
Well, there have been some challenges to Sackler Pesto for sure, and there still are. And that's that's great, you know, that's how it should be. But I guess it's it goes back to that first mover advantage we had. People expect their pesto to taste like Sackler does. Um, and we were very lucky that we were first. Yeah, the pioneers. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, we've... We've, as I said, we've got lots of recipes. We've got um, different pack sizes. We've got, um, you know, products for different lifestyles, um, and that's been that's been an advantage. So, m- moving on, then in two thousand and nine, Foodopedia vote you Woman of the Year. <laughs> so, t- tell us about that. What was why? <laughs> Goodness knows, I think, you know, probably they'd run out of everybody else. <laughs> Look, I think I get asked so many times about what's it like being a woman in business. And I, I it's hard to answer because I don't know what it's like being a man. <laughs> um, I just know that I work as hard as I possibly can. You know, you do the best by your stakeholders, shareholders, by your product, by your team of people that, that work with you. Um, and I sh- I'm sure most men do that as well. I do say, I have a couple of ways I express it. Sometimes I say it's not all bad being a woman, you know, or women should use their unfair legal advantages. And we do have quite a few. To some extent, we're ultimate challenger brands, aren't we? We can walk into a room and we can look very, very different from everybody else. So you can have great standout. You know, we're we're a bit of a novelty still sometimes, sadly. (laughs) But I think men and women all do their best. Challenger brands. I've not thought of it. Work hard. (laughs) Work hard and do your best. Mm. Um, So I've I've been very, very lucky to be... um, recognized for some of the things that I've done um I'm very proud of that but I wouldn't have done it without teams of people behind me without the parent company um and I've just had so much fun so yeah it's been a huge honor well I mean whilst we're on that of course it would be remiss of me not to mention the grand OBE which at the end of 15 arrived so so you know you're trying to be very modest about foodopedia's woman of the year 2009 but I think a new year's honors list at the end of 15 services to food industry says quite a lot doesn't it about working hard and yeah it was an, an amazing recognition and coincidentally at the uh, same time as our 25th anniversary of the business so it was a very very happy moment what was the first you knew about that what what was the moment where there perhaps was even a clue that one might be on its way in the post i arrived home one evening after a, a, a quite a busy day the kids were in the kitchen along with my husband And I opened this letter that had come all with sort of HMRC branding and stuff, stamps and franking. And I thought it was some kind of, you know, tax issue. (laughs) You immediately (laughs) thought the words. I opened this letter and I'm afraid I did swear. My children were absolutely horrified. And I just stood with this letter that was from the Prime Minister's office asking that would I, if it were to be offered, would I accept and uh, so that was in the November. God, I didn't drink for a month because I was so worried that I would tell someone. <laughs> well, did <laughs> so it, did I, yeah, it, it said, I yeah, don't know. Did, yeah. You mustn't tell anyone, you know, this is this is confidential. Well, that must have been hard. Claire. It was so and, hard and for me. you don't like it, I was going to say, yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. no, that yeah. must have, I would have found that impossible. It was very, very hard. Yeah. So obviously then, you know, by that stage, the kids knew. I was terrified it would slip out through them with their, yeah. not them, you know, yeah. enthusiasm. But um, amazingly, we did manage to keep it a secret. No, because it is, it's an amazing thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it was I mean, amazing. It doesn't happen very often in life that one yeah. gets that. Yeah. Anyway, so that aside, can I come back to the brand then? Because much of this conversation has been about the products, the quality of the products, the range of the products, the timing of the products, and a lot to do with this end and the Italian end being clear, brave, experimental, challenging, all those things. I'm just wondering where the brand fits into this story, Um, whether actually what's caused this £40 million success is fantastic products, well-marketed, well-made and well-marketed, or has there been a bit of sort of magic dust 
around the brand that's helped it be on the products? It's probably a bit of both. I, I, if you push me to say what it was, I think it, it was magic. It was a, a, an amazing bit of sort of serendipity. Back in 1990, World Cup, mm. love affair with all things Italian. No, it's a perfect storm, we were, isn't it? Yeah. This mm. Italian mm. brand launching onto the market with something completely new, new. and different and aspirational and, and quite in some ways quite sexy, you know, mm. it's a, made a really great bowl of pasta. And um, and we arrived, we've got a, a family story behind it. You know, it was just layer upon layer of deliciousness. But Claire, at, at 109, quite brave. I mean, nobody yeah. was flogging pasta sauce, mm. which is how it would have been mm-hmm. seen at that sort of money. Mm-hmm. So was, was there a moment there of, blimey, can we get away with this? No, not really, because we had no choice. No, that's just that's what out. pesto yeah. costs. Yeah. And and at the end of the day, the retailers are all looking for value. Mm. Um, you know, premium and proud. And mm. we have to be proud of, of the premium. Mm. And actually, you know, OK, it was 109. A packet of pasta at the time would have been, what shall I guess, probably about the same price as it is now, actually, probably 50p. So you could get a meal for four onto the table for £1.50. Hey, that's not bad in anybody's terms, mm. is it? Mm-hmm. A very concentrated sauce, a little goes a long way. Uh, when you deconstruct it, it's pretty good value. I was talking the other day with somebody about the money we'll spend on an espresso capsule. People don't say, gosh, that's, I don't know, I don't drink coffee, so I'm not aware of the price. But people don't say, gosh, that's a pound a shot. And if I buy it in a big bag, it's only 50p a shot. You know, They pay for the experience that they're getting from an espresso capsule, the experience, the convenience, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we need to think of products a little bit more like that. You know, Do I get an experience? Has this wowed my food life? Has it transformed the way I'm going to eat and feel on a Tuesday night when it's pouring with rain outside, the kids are at my heels they're squabbling and trying to get homework done and and if I put this bowl of pesto down in front of my family everybody will eat it everybody will chat there's no arguments over the food everybody's smiling suddenly a little bit of Italianness in me you know and, and you transform your Tuesday night supper so that's really our mission it's a bit like that NASA one isn't it with the janitor who says I'm yeah. helping put a man on the moon yeah. we're helping make Tuesday nights yeah. better transforming food lives family harmonies absolutely yeah. family yeah. harmonies yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but back to the brand then uh, has to what extent has it been just the name on the label rather than than an engine that has pulled demand or interest or warranted the premium i think if we'd um, if we'd done research in the very early days on that name we probably wouldn't have used it it's an, an acronym it stands for societa anonima commercio lavorazione alimentaria which is basically takes us back to our roots of when we were part of a cooperative um, and it doesn't actually sound particularly Italian. Most Italian words end with an I or an O as far as we Brits are concerned. Mm. So even to this day, you know, 30 years later, we get Scala and Salca. So as I said, we probably wouldn't have, we wouldn't have started from here. Um, but um, we have worked really hard and tirelessly over the years to make that brand mean something. And whilst not everybody can say it, and not everybody is spontaneously aware of that brand, you know, most people will draw other elements of the brand. They'll draw the jar or they'll talk about the copper lid. or So it has just become synonymous with great Italian food for an awful lot of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, well, certainly my experience with it is it, it takes people a moment, doesn't it? Oh, they're the ones that do that great pesto with that copper. Oh, yes, I think I've got yeah. one of those in the cupboard. Yeah. It's one of those brands. Absolutely. And yeah. they can you can they can draw the curvy jar. I don't actually like being in the cupboard very much. Mm. I, you know, I want to be on the pasta mm. on Tuesday night mm. supper. Well, I, I dare <laughs> say. It's a bit of a store cupboard. But one really feature think. I think I've noticed over the years with, with you is how much you've worked with the trade and then the customers, as you call them, which they are, of course. And uh, it's probably a, a, a very difficult comparison to make between them and consumers. But my understanding is that the brand is extremely well thought of in the trade and you make lots of product for lots of the customers anyway. So that that, that side of the business is well shored up. Absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, you have to remember that, that our customers, those people sitting in head office making those 
buying decisions are also consumers. Mm. Um, and so we should talk to them in that way. And as I said, we make what consumers want to buy, not what the factory wants to make. Um, we're wowing food lives. So we want to wow their food lives just as much as we want to wow the consumers. So when we go in to meet them, we try and make that a much more positive experience for them. You know, this is a brand that talks about being spirited. So our meetings with our customers certainly have to be that. You have to be different. We can't be yet another PowerPoint presentation, yet another, you know, boring hour long meeting. Think how many people they see so we've got to stand out we've got to be pioneering authoritative authentic and they say you know product creates the experience experience creates reputation and reputation creates the brand and we work really hard on those three elements mm, very good so here we are 28 years in <laughs> You've been there since the start. Dare I remind listeners, I mentioned 26, so they can probably work out r- approximate age. And in all that time, you've taken it from, well, zero to, it's no secret, it's 40 million-ish, isn't it? How do you think you would describe your own business or management or leadership style then? So you can have all sorts of psychometric tests done, can't you, these days? And we use one particular tool here in the business that that talks about how I like to lead from the trenches. And of course I do, you know, pesto's my first child and then my husband's my second and my two children are my third (laughs) and fourth. And, um, you know, I'm really, really passionate about it. So I'm very, very involved in the business. My job now is much less about selling pesto um, in terms of going to see customers as I did in the early days. But, you know, every moment is selling pesto. You're selling the experience and the dream of it. Um, Today, with all the challenges that we're we're facing politically, economically, uh, I probably worry more about pennies than I used to do. my job, you know, to inspire the, the team here is is in selling the vision to them, um, letting them see where we're headed, where we're going, the right sense of direction, giving them the confidence. Um, I have a lot to do with the parent company in terms of strategy and, and setting the strategy and the vision moving forward. Um, they're going through a lot of change as well as a business uh, on the international stage. We're in 60 markets around the world. So that's a lot of management there. Um And I think the most important thing that we try and instill here is that every team member has to try and live and breathe what we call this Italian wow-how. So being able to reflect the brand values, pioneering, authentic, spirited, authoritative in everything that we do, living and breathing that wow-how, remembering why we're here and, and just doing our best. And to what extent do you think all of them actually really do that and I don't mean in a sort of you doing a critical judgment I mean the extent to which they find themselves in here as a place of work and living those values is them finding themselves and living in their truth do you think you know 100% 80% 50% I'd I'd say we were in the high 90% on that and remember it's It's skewed slightly by the recruitment policy. You know, everybody is screened for their pioneeringness, their spiritedness, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly as it should be. At at the interview stage, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, it's very much about fit. Uh, within this culture when before they're even offered the job uh, when they join we go to great lengths to make sure that we um, we lead by example so when we send out the offers to a new employee they get sent a, um, a bottle of Prosecco to say congratulations and then when we get their acceptance letters back they get a hamper of Italian food so they can start playing with the product so by the time they actually arrive they're pretty well most new employees are aren't they very engaged we have team lunches uh, once a month. We have learning lunches, probably about the same frequency. We have quarterly reviews. We have we do a lot of team stuff. That means they've really got no choice but to live and breathe the values and uh, and, and and be inspired. So, I think the best thing to be in this life is curious, and if you can um, bring curious people along with you, they're going to look after this baby, aren't they? 
Yeah, and you certainly used to talk an awful lot about JFDI. I wonder where that's gone in all yeah, this. Yeah, I do. I, I, I think pace is, is really key because nobody's got a monopoly on a good idea. Anybody can have a good idea. I thought I'd had a good one over the weekend <laughs> and then, blow me, it was in the grocer. So JFDI, just flipping do it. You know, you, you have to make mistakes to learn. Um, there is no blame culture here. It's very much about, right, we've messed up. What do we learn from it so it doesn't happen again? There's no time like the present. Mm. Just get on and, and do it. Mm. And that's partly my profile. And not all the team here would would be um, making their decisions in the same way as I make mine. I make mine from my gut. Other people will make theirs using data but generally speaking you know this trajectory is you have to trust your gut on certain occasions um and that's really what i'm paid to do isn't it Mm, mm, is to is to make decisions for the business so um gut instinct really really important i would value it wouldn't i somebody who makes their decisions based on information would probably disagree with me so it's that what we try and encourage is the, is the combination here in the business. So taking that then, that's your predominant leadership style then. And we want everyone in the business to celebrate the values and live that spirit. Have you had to codify that stuff in order that people can access it in the way that they can digest it? Absolutely. And I think when you make decisions from your gut you um you're doing it because you just feel that Mm. it's right and sometimes i find it really hard to express why i think we should do what i'm recommending and and for a person who needs that information that is really really hard um we've got some people in the business fortunately in the leadership team especially who are a bit more balanced than i am but they feel it as much as you do presumably yeah yeah and, and I, whilst I'm very happy to use, um, you know, our, our big chunked up language around the brand, for a lot of people, they need more words. They th- they need another three, five, ten words to, well, what do you mean by pioneering, Claire? I know what I mean by pioneering and I just run with it. But for a lot of people, you do need to decodify. You need to give them more information. They need to reflect. Um, but, you know, You've, it's embracing that everybody's different. And it's taken me a really long time to get to that. You've known me a long time. I haven't always been like this. I've definitely mellowed, haven't I, Robert? Well, you, you have. No, I, <laughs> that I, I, know, so. I know you're slightly teasing. <laughs> no, but, but you have. Um, and I think the, the, the combination of you being very uh, food, so MPD knowledge, I mean, extraordinary knowledge of Italian food, uh, and also having an innate marketing sense, in other words, of what the market will bear, what's going to happen next, uh, and your JFDI and high energy way of doing it, I could see how people might feel left behind and sort of running quite hard to get close to keeping up. So I think in all the time we work together, there's always been a need for some sort of codification so that people can mm-hmm. climb their way into it in some way and then hope to keep up because it does, you know, it's a meteor that keeps Yeah. Keeps flying. I think if you try and decode something too much, though, it can lose exactly. its real no, essence. It, exactly, it, so. and that's, the, that's always been, I think, from my perspective, one of the issues, which is how do you codify or provide the framework without tampering with that the, the white heat of... Mm the gut and the energy mm-hmm. and the spirit and the drive to just JFDI. On that note, Claire, I, I, we'll cease and I will thank you very much. Uh, we've made several references to the fact we've worked together over the years, but I think we have been able to pull off one of those very hard and possibly quite Italian things to do in business whereby we can be business associates and friends and it's easier said than done but I think we've just about achieved that haven't we it's that word pleasure again business and pleasure I hadn't heard of that no business and pleasure well it's been a great pleasure and pleasure (laughs) (laughs) thanks again Claire please do subscribe to the podcast in your usual podcast app to get new episodes when they're released if you have any comments or questions don't hesitate to get in touch with me It's Robert at robertbeanbranding.com. Thanks for listening.